Infective endocarditis, now as the name suggests, endocarditis means inflammation of the innermost layer of the heart, which is called as endocardium, and infective means it is caused by some kind of microorganism. So when some kind of infective organisms are going to affect the innermost layer of the heart, that is endocardium, it's called as infective endocarditis. Now what really it, well, what, what really happens in this case? Now there is invasion of these microbial agents and they invade the heart walls or the mural endocardium and cause a lot of destruction along with they lead to formation of these big bulky friable vegetations now when we say bulky they are generally uh, more than five millimeter in diameter that means if it's more than five millimeter it's more likely to be an infective or uh, infective inf infective vegetations and if they are bulky they are going to be friable and they are mainly composed of necrotic debris they are having a lot of thrombotic material thrombotic material means you have fibrin you have platelets and of course you have to have organisms now if they have organisms we can easily differentiate them from other types of endocarditis or other types of valvular diseases in which you are not supposed to find any organisms for example you have rheumatic heart disease you have Livman sac endocarditis you have nbte in these in, in these cases you're not supposed to find any organism whereas in this case you will find organisms apart from the heart walls and the mural endocardium it can also affect the aorta and other blood vessels of the heart some kind of aneurysm sac or any prosthetic device which is present inside the heart like prosthetic walls and so on now, based on the severity and based on the tempo of the inflammation, you can divide them into acute endocarditis and a subacute endocarditis. Now, what is the basic difference between acute and subacute? It is based on how virulent the organism is. Plus, is it is it going to affect the normal wall or is it going to affect the abnormal or a previously abnormal wall? If it's acute endocarditis, you the, the, the patients are infected by a highly virulent organism. And if the vir if the organism is highly virulent, it is going to affect a previously normal wall. So, so that means if there is something is not is normal, it it can only be destroyed by a highly virulent organism. But if something is previously abnormal, even, even a low virulent organism can cause damage to the heart. So when it, it is caused by high virulent organism and affects the normal wall, it's called as acute endocarditis, which is a very, very severe disease and causes death within days to weeks. Whereas if it is caused by a low virulence organism on an abnormal heart wall, it's called as a subacute endocarditis, and most of them, they recover after antibiotic therapy. Now, as we have already discussed, if it affects the normal walls, we call it an acute endocarditis. But in some cases, it may also affect abnormal walls. And those abnormal walls are the walls which can be seen in rheumatic heart disease. You have mitral wall prolapse, you have a congenital bicuspid aortic wall, you have calcific valvular stenosis, or you may have some kind of uh, you know prosthetic devices inside your heart like prosthetic heart walls, you have pacemaker lines, or any kind of indwelling vascular catheters or damaged endocardium by a jet stream. Whenever you have such kind of thing that this is a, so it is a stream of a, uh, a jet of blood which is damaging the endocardium it becomes a nice foci of formation of uh, of bacterial seeding there are some risk factors like neutropenia immunodeficiency malignancy diabetes mellitus alcohol or intravenous drug abuses the most common cause of um, infective endocarditis is, is a very benign bacteria which is present inside your oral flora which is called as streptococcus viridens and since it is present inside inside you it, you already have it, it it has to be something which is of a low virulence and we know that low virulent organisms they damage the abnormal walls so this is going to be a subacute bacterial endocarditis whereas staph aureus is commonly seen in normal or abnormal walls and it is also one of the most common causative organism in intravenous drug abuses there is an, another category called as HACEK, which is an anagram of these uh, uh, five bacteria, which are again a normal oral flora. They are again something which is having a low virulence, so that means they are also going to cause SABE as compared to ABE. So you have H. influenza, Echinobacillus, Cardiobacterium, Echinella, and Kingella, plus fungi, Rickettsia, 
Q fever, the, one, the, the ones which can cause Q fever, chlamydia, gram negative infections, all those things can also, enterococci, they all can lead to infective endocarditis. Now, what could be this source of infection? It could be a very tri trivial trauma. It could be something which is happening inside your, your it, it could be a dental procedure. It, it could be a dental procedure whenever they just actually mess up with your oral cavity and have some invasive procedure or some kind of procedure inside your, inside your oral cavity. This predisposes you to a transient bacteremia. That means there is some amount of bacteria which is present inside your blood and that bacteria is going to reach into your heart and may cause infective endocarditis. In some cases, you have something called as a culture negative endocarditis. That means if you do a blood culture, you're not, you, you cannot really find the, the, the causative organism. Now, why does that happen? Because sometimes what happens is this bacteria gets buried deep down inside these vegetations. They are bulky vegetations as we have seen earlier. So these bulky vegetations, they, they, they have three, uh, two or three layers and uh, you see that the, the bacteria is present somewhere deep inside these bulky vegetations. So when they're present deep inside the bulky vegetations, they cannot be really cultured sometimes. So we, so we call it a culture negative endocarditis. And this is the same reason why we need a high dosage of antibiotics, why we need a high uh, uh, a long course of high dosage of antibiotics in these cases because you know the walls do not have their own dedicated blood supply so they have to to actually rely upon whatever is present inside the heart chambers whatever blood is present inside the heart chambers so we need to have a high dosage of of, endo, uh, of antibiotics for a longer duration to tackle these organisms now as far as morphology is concerned as we have discussed they are going to be friable bulky and destructive vegetations they can be single or multiple and they have fibrin inflammatory cells and organisms within is the most common hard walls in wall are on the left side you have aortic wall and the the the, the, the mitral wall in cases of intravenous drug abusers tricuspid wall is the most commonly affected wall in some cases they may cause damage to the underlying myocardium and may cause something called as a ring abscess now when they form they cause all these destructive vegetations these vegetations are going to be friable as we have seen here they are going to be friable vegetations and if they they may break down and if they break down they are going to embolize and if they embolize they can cause problems if they are being embolized from the left side of the heart they are going to be entering they're going to enter the systemic circulation and if they're on the right side of your heart they're going to enter the the pulmonary circulation and will cause septic infarcts in those particular areas uh, subacute vegetations will also have some granulation tissue chronic inflammation fibrosis and calcification which actually shows that they have more of a chronic elements as compared to the acute ones so here you can see here there is a mitral valve prolapse and you can see these destructive vegetations which are present along this wall in this case you can see a very destructive a highly destructive lesion which has almost destroyed one of the wall this is actually a congenital bicuspid aortic valve and in this case it has caused a lot of damage and it has also caused damage to the myocardium which is along the commissure and it has caused um, this uh, ring abscess now clinical features are mainly if it's acute fever chills weaknesses if it's subacute they may have some vague flu like symptoms like slight fever fatigue loss of weight some joint pain and uh, murmurs can be seen Numbers can be heard in more than 90% of the patients with left heart uh, regions and they have cardiac and extra cardiac complications in this form. The, the cardiac complications can be valvular stenosis. If it is causing a lot of fibrosis like in subacute, you may have, uh, the, the, the patients may end up having stenosis but most commonly they cause a, a lot of destruction so the patients will have a lot of insufficiency or, or, or regurgitations. They can cause perforation of the walls, rupture of the walls, and aneurysms of the wall leaflets. They can cause abscesses in the wall ring. They can uh, destroy deeper tissues of the myocardium and may lead to myocardial abscesses. And if it is 
a highly destructive it may even reach the pericardium and may lead to suppurative pericarditis and if it's and the heart when is is quite leaky because of insufficiency and is not able to pump you the the patient may it may end up having cardiac failure the extra cardiac complications because we know we they have emboli they are friable vegetations they may break down and they may cause these emboli from the left side of the heart and they may now enter the systemic circulation and will cause in fact in, in infarct abscesses and and mycotic aneurysms if the emboli are on the right side of the heart they are going to enter the the pulmonary circulation and that's that's quite simple i mean if you have the heart which is like this if you have the 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 mitral and the aortic wall and you have agitations which are present over here they are going to enter into the systemic circulation for example you have something which is in the if if let's say this is the arch of aorta and you have this left common carotid artery and then these vegetations if they break down they are going to enter into this left common carotid artery and will reach all the way into the brain and may lead to stroke but if they are present on the tricuspid wall in the right side of the heart they are going to go towards the the lungs right so they are going to affect the affect the the lungs and may have pulmonary abscesses or pulmonary micro abscesses these small emboli if they enter the systemic circulation they may reach in different areas of your body like skin and conjunctiva and may cause petechiae and these petechiae because contain they contain some toxic elements like bacteria and they will cause those skin and uh conjunctival damages in some cases they may cause these painful tender nodules on the finger tips of the hands or toes of the feet and they are called as osseous node that means something which is palpable are nodes they are called as osseous nodes something which is non palpable they are non tender painless maculopapular region on the pulp of the fingers they are called as genuine spots or genuine lesions on the nail uh, on the nail bed these people have splinter hemorrhages in the retina if you do a fundoscopy you can see rot spots which are whitish uh, spots on the uh, which which can be seen under fundoscopy if they go all the way into the kidneys and they may incite an immune reaction and these immune complexes may get entrapped inside the kidneys and may lead to hematuria albuminuria and renal failure in some cases and which is focolectizing glomerulonephritis this is duke's criteria and you can see this double m m and three small m's and five small m these are actually two major one major and three minor or five minor so these are those major and minor criteria the major criteria means when you have a positive blood culture of the of that organism you have a positive echocardiographic findings you have a new valvular regurgitations they are the the major criteria but if you have a predisposing heart lesion fever acute phase reactions like increased esr or crp they are uh, uh, you have vascular lesions like arterial petechiae you have subungual splinter hemorrhages emboli septic infarcts mycotic organism uh, aneurysms intracranial hemorrhages genuine lesions immunological phenomena microbial evidence echocardiogram finding echocardiogram findings consistent with but not diagnostic of endocarditis all these come under the the minor criteria so if you have two major criteria the criteria are met for infective endocarditis if you have one major and three three minor any three of them or you have five minor criteria you can call the thing as infective endocarditis so you can see those splinter hemorrhages are present here these are the the rot spots these are those lesions which can be painful they are called as osseous nodes they can be present here which which look something like this they can be called as genuine lesions so with this we end our topic on infective endocarditis